A very good evening to all of you. And uh, I take pleasure in welcoming all the participants to this 36th webinar. These leadership conversations we are holding every Friday at 7.30 p.m. Today, yet again, we have a very distinguished leader with us, Dr. Varaprasad Reddy, the founder of Shanta Biotech at Hyderabad. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Varaprasad Reddy. Welcome, sir. Greetings from ICFI. Thank you. Good evening okay. to everyone. Thank you, sir. What I will do now is I will very quickly move to the introduction of the guest, and then we will allocate more time for his talk as well as the ensuing question and answer session. So allow me to share my screen. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, as I said, we have uh, Dr. Varprasad Reddy with us. We are extremely fortunate to have him in the same space of the screen that we are, and we are going to have a very interesting discussion this evening. First, 20 minutes or so, I requested, uh, but generally, if it is more than 20 minutes also, it's okay for his opening talk, followed by moderated questions and answers. My esteemed colleague, uh, Professor Prasad, is also with us here, who will start the moderation. A brief about such, a, such an impressive profile, a very large profile, but I don't know if I'm able to do justice, but I'll try to speed it up and quickly highlight important points in the profile and achievements of Dr. Varaprasad Reddy. He's an engineer who graduated in electronics and communications from Andhra University and also an MBA from Osmania University. Initially, Dr. Varaprasad Reddy worked as a research scientist in Defense Electronics Research Laboratories, Hyderabad, and also subsequently at APIDC. He left government and became an entrepreneur by joining Hyderabad Batteries Limited. In 1992, he promoted Shanta Biotechnics Private Limited with a great objective of developing recombinant-based vaccines and therapeutic proteins for human healthcare. The mission is to produce cost-effective human healthcare products to reach the common man at an affordable price while maintaining international standards and quality. That's an amazing mission for an organization that started in 1992 and how it became popular, all of us knew. India's first genetically engineered product, Shanvac B vaccine against Hepatitis B was developed through in-house R&D and it was launched commercially in the year 1997 and made the country proud because of its high efficacy and very interestingly, low cost. In the same spirit of low cost and high efficacious products, other products that they launched were Shanferon, Shankinase, Shanpoitin, Shan Tetra, Shan 5 and Shan 6, Shan Hip, Shan TT, were developed and launched. All these products were approved by WHO. For cholera, which is called Shancol, Shanta Biotech is the only company that developed full-fledged oral cholera vaccine from India, which is approved by WHO. Several contributions to society, some of them are 18 crores worth vaccines distributed free of cost, 17 crores worth vaccines sold at subsidized prices and supported several NGOs like uh, Rotary Club, Red Cross, Lions Club, and many others. A proud son of this country, Dr. Varprasad Reddy was uh, honored by Padma Bhushan, by Government of India in the year 2005, and many other awards that decorated him are from Institution of Engineers in 2008, Hyderabad Management Association, then CEO Clubs International, prestigious Ernst and Young Entrepreneur of the Year in the year 2000 for Healthcare and Life Sciences, the National Technology Award in 1999 for Shan B and again uh, 2003 for Shan Ferron. Uh, Department of Scientific Industrial Research, the Government of India body, award for the best R&D efforts in industry in 1998 for Shan B and again in 2003 for Shan Ferron. Uh, FAPSI awards uh, in 2004 and 2005, there are numerous awards and also American Telugu Association, as we popularly called ATA, in the year 98 itself, they awarded uh, for research in the field of biotechnology. State Bank of India also honored uh, Sir with the Pragna Bharati Puraskar in 2002. Pune University has declared him as Man of the Year Award in 2008. So like this, several awards and several accomplishments in his illustrious career. And uh, Dr. Varprasad Reddy also has a special liking and interest in Telugu literature and Carnatic music, Veena. With this brief introduction, what I will now do is, I will 
request our esteemed guest to actually start his talk on this topic of healthcare entrepreneurship, how the leadership and social responsibility are enmeshed with healthcare entrepreneurship with special emphasis and focus on the journey of Shanta Biotech, uh, how this can be highlighted and how this can be laid out as a path for young entrepreneurs and others to emulate and follow. Over to you, sir. I once again welcome you and thank you for agreeing to speak with us. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. My best wishes to all the participants in this program who may be aspiring to become entrepreneurs. I will uh, briefly touch upon what is enterprise, enterprise and what is the entrepreneurship. And also, we have qualified entrepreneurism as social entrepreneurism. So I will come into that step also. Yes, all of us after our degrees, our post-graduation, or even after PhD, general tendency is to take care of our family by joining a job. That is the first idea that everybody will get to join a job and look for a job. There is nothing wrong in that, but over a period of time, more job seekers are waiting for jobs in the country and jobs are not well created by the responsible governments. Public sector is also saturated, rather they have become islands of surplus labor, so they raise their hands. No new public enterprises are forthcoming because the money that is available with governments are not being utilized to create jobs, but only to keep their political powers in place. They are doling out all the money for what you call Sanchema uh, Padakam. I don't know exact English for that. Uh, it is not good for the country when they are giving away free money in the name of welfare. pension for, pardon? Welfare activities? Welfare, welfare is different, sir. Welfare is good. But this is not welfare. They are giving them free money. Populist measures. They are not angry in them to look for a job. They are not creating job. Correct. And they are happy to receive free money, play with their smartphone, roam around the street, and when they come across a girl, they want to tease her. This is the situation in the country. So naturally, job seekers are more, job availability is less. When there is no public enterprise coming up newly into the country, especially you can look for the previous past our, in Indian history, after our independence, the first 25, 30 years only industrialization, many public sector undertakings have come. Now they are selling away all the units to private parties. That means government is washing away their hands. If that is the case situation, a new thinking should come for the students who are passing out. They should not be job seekers. They should be job providers. That is the only alternative. And there is a lot of scope also. When government is not getting into any business, Partly it is right also, government should not be in business. They should be only uh, what you call catalysts for the industrial growth. But when they don't create that kind of atmosphere, ambience, industry coming up is very difficult. With so, so many plethora of what you call permissions and then clearances and then acceptance, all these things are coming in the way of any enthusiastic entrepreneur. Uh, I will define an industrialist is there and an entrepreneur is there. What is the difference? Industri industrialist, actually, he might have started his career for industry as an entrepreneur. When he attains certain mass by way of sales, by way of profits, or by way of any growth, naturally, he wants to be called as industrialist and he doesn't want to be termed as entrepreneur. The reason is industrialist is having a, a sort of what you call a dignity in the community. But an entrepreneur is one who is always struggling to make it or to achieve what he wants to achieve. But my point is, if people remain as entrepreneurs, the zeal of making something new, the zeal of continuously doing something better that is there, 
then he will see much better progress and he is the person to be encouraged entrepreneurs should be encouraged to remain as entrepreneurs and what are the characteristic of entrepreneur and what are the characteristics of industrialist if you see you will appreciate why i impress upon you that people should remain as entrepreneurs entrepreneur is one who is not rational in his thinking he always in a hurry mode to do something faster something better he will not be satisfied with whatever sales or whatever one product or two products he launched in the market he is always on the lookout for more and more products or rather more improvements in the product or rather looking for new areas to enter this is the quality of an entrepreneur industrialist when the moment he attains certain mass by way of sales by way of products by way of geographical uh, what you call extension he will become very careful he will become more logical and he starts calculating he will apply logic when i do this product when i invest so much of money what time does it take how much money i am going to burn what the cash burning rate how many more people are required whether the technology what i acquired is having longevity or obsolescence is coming up very fast so that the product lifeline life cycle is diminishing everything will come into his mind to calculate very 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 methodically analyze and then come to a conclusion to make it or not to make it entrepreneur doesn't have all these things he doesn't have anything any mass he has not acquired big uh, arena but kingdom he is still trying to achieve something he is in that mode mentally maybe he has something in hand but still mentally he is on the running path he doesn't apply any logic he always want to do new things and new innovations so people when they remain as entrepreneurs lot of good can happen to society so people who have become already industrialists when they brand themselves they are industrialists the growth rate is naturally diminished if not there may be growth but it is not useful to society they will be only expanding or improving their businesses only to maximize their profits but not the social concern that is the nature quite nature of industrialist because he, is, he has become logical he has become selfish he has become more careful and ultimately his interest is for himself not for the society entrepreneur can have some social outlook and that's called social entrepreneurism there are many opportunities to make money there are many industries which are readily available no need to have any market research or anything i can give an example people can get into normally what a businessman thinks is he wants to have a single customer so that he does he need not to have big big marketing network or branch offices or uh, what you call dealers or distributors if there is one customer very good for him and number 2 if the customer is government much better number 3 if he can talk to them with one person he can have his market totally such kind of business also are there today contracts are like that today liquor making is like that that is also a business that is also enterprise do we want that kind of businesses is the concern a social entrepreneur will not think in those lines he will not count for if i start this industry is it going to be helpful to society one number two he doesn't calculate what is the annual compounded growth rate what normally in mba they teach for every student when you take up a industry what is its acgr what is it return on equity what is return on investment what is the gestation period what is the obsolescence rate of the technology whatever it is what is the competition whether any government policy is going to help us with incentives is it on priority line or non priority sector all these things will come into force but a social entrepreneur will not think should not think i hope they carry this message example i can give you suppose everybody when they say that you are doing whatever is good for the society only you should take up then my hard earned money 
Why should I be a social entrepreneur? Who will save me when there is a difficult time? That is a natural question they get. So naturally, they will be very, what you call, uh, diffident to start anything which is having some social relevance. They think that being socially relevant enterprise, they may not get the expected profits and they will not be reckoned as successful enterprise. This is the stumbling block in their mind. And for such people, Shanta is one example, what I can quote. By that, you can understand when your intentions are noble, nature will conspire to make it happen. Whatever you want, you can do it. With all the limitations, with all the hurdles, what I have gone through is my, my journey in Shanta is a good example for anybody who, who wants to think to be a social entrepreneur. In 92, 93, we didn't had any high-end technology-based vaccines. We were using the technology of those vaccines are also imported or bought out or they are packed here, bulk we used to import and then we used to boil them and then distribute it here. So there is no basically any research done on vaccines. Naturally, all the products are coming from outside. A regular routine vaccines for the last 40 years we have been getting from outside or we are making them. They are low-end vaccines. They are not biotech-based. They are conventional vaccines, what we call BCG, DPT, MR, MMR, etc. But as the civilization goes on, new kinds of lifestyles are coming, new kinds of exposures are coming. We are abusing the nature. We are abusing our environment. New kinds of viruses also are growing and new kinds of uh, infections also are coming. Such one is the hepatitis B in 92. India had 45 million infected people in the country. China had at the time 50 million, but we don't have our own vaccine. The vaccine for against hepatitis B was made only in two countries with a very novel technology called recombinant DNA technology. It is not uh, easy technology in those days. So it was limited only to two countries and uh, that vaccine was sold in America at $100 per dose. Three doses are required to, you, to immunize any human being. Other country was UK and we were not able to adopt it into immunization schedule because it's a very, very high cost. In India, the government policy is vaccines to be given free of cost to all the newborn babies. If this vaccine also to be given, then we have to import at a very high cost. And government was not prepared to invest so much of money uh, to distribute free of cost. If they don't include this into the schedule by ignoring the pandemic situation of hepatitis B in 92, they want to get away. They were closing their eyes, ignoring it as not an essential thing. But when I came to know about the impact of hepatitis B and how many people are going to be affected by that and how they can pass on from one individual to other individual. Its uh, propagation is very fast and by many means. In those days in 92, we were very much obsessed with uh, AIDS. AIDS can come from one person to other person only through sex, only through sex. But hepatitis B can come from one person to other person. It can be infected by outdoor games, by using the normally in hostels, students use the same comb, same razor, same tumbler. It can come through saliva. When each person rubs against each other in open games like kabaddi, etc., they also can get infected. Even saliva is the source of infection. So what happens is at least one percent of the infected persons will get into cancer. Hundred percent, one percent. 1% is sure to get cancer and 30 to 40% of the people who got infected will become sick. They are dependent on public exchequer or on the family and the earning capacity will go down. His life becomes terrible and people who are depending on them cannot get their best out of that person. So he will become a burden to the family. He is not a resource person anymore. He is a dependent on the society and the family. They are the impacts. That's why WHO, in their seminar in 92, September, October, was very 
I mean, what you call, they were talking very uh, unparliamentary language that some countries have ignored this and they are, uh, they don't want to support any health uh, management systems in those countries where they have not adopted this humanist schedule. I heard about it and I requested some of the legends in India to take up development of this vaccine. Uh, but those legends, they are very good in their own subject, pharmaceutical business people. My background is electronics. So I appealed to the internet people in pharmaceutical line. All of them, they were under the impression that these vaccines, new vaccines, what I'm talking about, hepatitis B, et cetera, they're all recombinant based, biotechnology based vaccines. They felt that biotechnology is not yet ripened in India. Their misgiving is that we are not prepared for biotech-based vaccines. I am, I am not having enough knowledge of that. I am not a life sciences student. Ignorance is sometimes bliss. This is what the people who are listening, aspiring entrepreneurs should listen. Not necessary everybody should be having expertise in the domain to start an industry in that domain. Tata's have built steel factories 100 years, 150 years back. They were not metallurgical engineers. Tata's came into Aeronauticals, they are not aeronautical engineers. Tata's are automobiles now. Are they automobile engineers? They are entrepreneurs. They remained as entrepreneurs. They are not industrialists. That is the difference between an industrialist and an entrepreneur. So when all the legends have backed out that biotechnology is not there in the country, I jumped into it. I do not know anything of it, the ABCD of it. In those times, because biotechnology is a new word, and also hepatitis B not well propagated about the message. Government was keeping mum with the fear that public will demand a free vaccine. They were not making any announcement other than AIDS. AIDS, there is no solution even today. In those days, AIDS was projected as the demon and on every bus you can see the dirty slogans use condom. They were taking loan to propagate about AIDS but they were not prepared to invest money to R&D to make a vaccine. Of course, now situation changed. COVID brought an enormous change in the minds of government. Now, prime ministers are running to the companies, sir, when are you making this vaccine? In those days, I could not get an interview or appointment with even a health secretary, forget about health minister or prime minister. In those odd times, I do not know the subject, Country is not aware of hepatitis B pills, and they have not heard about this. In it, it is a medicine. So naturally, it has a regulatory system where they accept a product, just not like that, but it has to go through several tests over a period of its development. At every stage, they have to test it, approve it. There are no testing mechanisms, there are no protocols evolved for this pro process of uh, biotech-based product. So when there is no process to evaluate it, when the government is not willing to cooperate on it, and banks have not come forward to fund it, there is no philosophy in the government to make it to make it available in the country. And I do not have knowledge on this. There is no other company to emulate or copy how to build a biotech-based lab or production center. Again, there is so many arts. As an entrepreneur, I could succeed. Without the domain knowledge, without the support of funding from any bank, without the protocols for testing and government willingness to accept this product, we could develop a product I mean, in the year 1997 with five years of research. Our scientists have done a wonderful job. It is not me, it's my scientists who have done this job. I only teamed them to become a group of scientists to develop this product. So. An entrepreneur, when he has a dream, he can realize it with, with sense of perseverance, with a sense of commitment to the country at the cost. It is a social need. More people are dying in a day because of hepatitis B than due to AIDS in a year. That was the slogan given by WHO. So more people are dying in a day because of hepatitis B than AIDS in a year. But we talk about AIDS, we don't talk about hepatitis B. When government was silent, somebody has to take the mantle that somebody need not be expert in that domain. That's what my point is. Sir, if you have commitment for the country, for the common man in the country, nature will help you. 
that doesn't count for what is the ACGR, what is the return on investment. I do not know what I am making. I have committed myself this vaccine should be made it available, make it available locally, make it affordable to the common man. That's how the noble cause was supported by nature and it happened, our scientists have done. India has become third genetically capable nation in the world and it is a big milestone, uh, exactly coinciding 50 years of independence. 1997, we launched the product. Now India is the third biggest country in the world for biotech products. Today, our biotech business itself is around $50 billion. It was zero in 1992. A revolution has come, biotech parks have come, biotech ministers have come, biotech policies have been evolved. Today, it is a big thing in India, but the start point was so humble, so horrifying experience with no bank finance, no technology. I tried to get the technology from America. They were also very harsh. They said that your country is poor country, you can't afford it. They said that your scientists cannot absorb this technology, the latest technology. You are 50 years behind, 30 years behind our latest technology. That's what they said. But we proved them wrong. This country has eminent scientists, eminent engineers, but they are not being properly used. They were not given opportunity to evolve themselves. R&D is the, the matter in this country to make any progress. Innovation is very essential. Unfortunately, governments over a period of time, they are reducing the incentives for innovation. In R&D, when we spend one rupee, they used to give 150% concession for tax. That slowly 150% has come down to 100%, 75%, now zero. They are indirectly indicating innovation is not necessary in this country. We are getting screwdriver technology from outside in the name of Make in India. And they are coming with everything finished except snapping the cell phone. And we make that we are making cell phones here. Everything is done outside. Only snapping to the two parts of the cell phone is called make in India. The paradox, this country cannot progress this way. New entrepreneurs should come. They should take the cause of the nation. They should start a mini show. They should innovate. Either innovate or perish. This is the philosophy of the youth. So forget about what is made available by government. If you have tenacity, if you have perseverance, if you have a set of mind to make your country where you are living a better place to live for our future generations, a lot of opportunities. For example, I will tell you, recent COVID has given us a lot of lessons. While it has taken away the lives of people and livelihood of people, but it has opened our eyes that we are most unprepared. Test kits, why we should import from China? We can make ourselves. Our people made it, but they are late. Damage was done already. Even vaccine, we could develop our own vaccine. No need of AstraZeneca. Bharat Biotech has developed a vaccine with our own technology. Shanta did our own technology. 14 vaccines we did. Cholera, nobody in the world attempted. We did it. There is no depth for intellectual property here, but we don't cash it. Our IT professionals are going away to America. They are working like coolies there. They get hourly basis, coolie, wage. And they are depositing in the banks in the country. No doubt, country is benefited by dollars. But are we having any IP? The same words, the same uh, office uh, software, can we not develop? Our people only develop for them, for Microsoft. If we start our own R&D in IT, if we have our own IP, this country is, then we call it IT professional country. Today, I will not call this country as IT professional country. We are coolies for IT. There is no R&D, then we are doing only coolie for others, not for ourselves. Slowly, with the 100% FDI, we are sliding down to East India company levels. Every Indian company is being acquired by multinationals. They have a bag full of money. We have wonderful resource of human resources at low cost. They are using this land, this water, this intellectual. They do it at low cost. They are making hundreds of crores, hundreds of billions. Why our own people cannot do all these things? Unfortunately, institutions should take more time and push them to become entrepreneurs. And we should run the, uh, what you call, startup centers in every university, in every college. Encourage them for innovation and they will become 
the job providers, the country will become self-sufficient, self-reliant, no need to depend on anybody. COVID times, ventilators we have imported. Can we not make into ventilators? COVID has opened our eyes. There is no need of a generalized ventilator. A specific purpose ventilators also can be made at low cost. Specific purpose, any uh, monitoring equipment also can be made. Sanitation centers can be made. Isolation wards can be created. There is so much of scope for so many things. But unfortunately, the entrepreneurial G is not being encouraged by government or by the institutions. I think there should be more stress on people who are coming for taking a degree. Degree is not the ultimate goal of a student. There is only a weapon in their hand to do much better in their life. It is only a milestone. A degree taking is only a milestone in their life. With that degree, they should do something for the cause of the society, cause of the common man, and to for themselves. This is my uh, opening remarks. If there is a question, I can answer. Fantastic, sir. Thank you very much for that very impressive opening remarks on the topic of uh, healthcare entrepreneurship, which entails leadership and social responsibility. Very briefly, if I have to cover, this is a redefining of what is the difference between industrialist and an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur is someone who struggles and uh, builds up his idea, creates an enterprise, but when that entrepreneur grows uh, there is an image, there is an expansion that comes with the image. There's a scale up of operations. There's a lot of earning as well. With that, the size of the organization grows. And therefore, the next step of an industrialist happens to be in most of the cases, which is weighed, measured, rationality dipped in, in terms of those jargon like uh, ROI, ROE. Uh, and consolidation. Company, New word, consolidation. consolidation. Yes. All those factors come into play. Whereas Dr. Varaprasad Reddy has advocated that the entrepreneur should remain as entrepreneur, that zeal to continue to do something new and uh, worry about the social cause that the country is requiring at, at any point in time. I think we need to highlight that important aspect of entrepreneurship and preserve that entrepreneurship. In this journey, of uh, Shanta Biotech, the lessons for us are very interesting. Against adversities, against several difficulties, uh, a vaccine for hepatitis B was developed, first indigenously developed uh, uh, recombinant technology-based uh, uh, biotech vaccine in this country. I think that's a phenomenal achievement and a milestone that has made the country proud. And that has been achieved when nothing was actually going in favor of uh, uh, Shanta Biotech, which was established in 1993, 92 or 93. Government was not cooperating. They were not creating awareness. In fact, more people were dying out of hepatitis B than AIDS, but there was awareness being created more for AIDS than hepatitis B. The cost of importing these vaccines or medicines was too huge. And uh, the industry or the banking system was not ready to lend. The financing was far too difficult to get by. Early stage startups were not supported. The competition was with the nascent IT industry at the time. And similarly, when technology is not there, when nothing was going in favor, the principle that Dr. Varaprasad Reddy believed in is that if you have a noble cause, the nature will conspire to help you and make things work for you. If the cause that you have adopted is a noble cause, which is for the benefit of the country, for the social cause, then everything else will fall in place with that zeal of social entrepreneurship, which was displayed by Dr. Varaprasad Reddy. It was a fantastic uh, pitch. And we have learned what are the qualities that the institutions and government will have to push for encouraging startups, encouraging innovation, and thereby job creators who can make this country self-sufficient than any empty slogans. We need to follow through, we need to support, create the necessary ambience, and the government should act as a catalyst for industrial growth in this country. So with this overview, we will now enter into the detailed question and answer session. I'm very happy to announce here that a large number of participants have sent in questions, very interesting questions. These questions have been categorized into various clusters. And uh, those questions will be raised by myself and my esteemed colleague, Professor R. Prasad. 
uh, we, we take each cluster, Professor Prasad will start with one cluster, there will be four or five questions, and then I will come with the next cluster. So we will have about four clusters, and we'll try to cover as many questions as possible. We will not repeat the questions, and those which are already answered will not be touched upon. And now I request uh, Professor Rao Prasad, and I once again welcome all the participants to so stay tuned, uh, pay attention. I welcome Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Mahindra Redigaru, who has joined, and all, uh, all the senior members from across the country who have joined. Thank you very much. And now we move to the Q&A session, and I welcome Professor Prasad. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Professor Rao. Thank you very much, sir, for your uh, inspiring open, uh, opening uh, remarks. You have set a stage on what kind of mindset is needed from a students to become potential entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs. There are a lot of questions, but the opening question is something that we'd like to draw a little more from your background, sir. The very word and the, and the journey that you have taken from uh, being an electronics engineer to defense, to API DC, to HVL, to Shanta, and there on. So at each stage, there has been a change and you have gone ahead with the change. Can you enlighten us on the motivations that took you from one place to another so that as students, as potential entrepreneurs, we are in a position to gain from that. Sir, it is not by motivation I moved from one place to other place. I am very bold and uh, honest with you. I was not happy to continue there. It is not a motivation. I was demotivated. That's why I left that place. First, defense labs. Whatever we develop indigenously, they remained as prototypes. They went on to import. Ministry of Defense always had the flavor of imports. They started R&D units in DLR, LDR, DL, many defense labs. We were given a task, we do it, but ultimately they remain as prototypes. They go and buy outside. That is the frustration to me. After seven years, I said, here, little r, big D. I left it. I came to APADC. Not that I wanted to join APADC. I, my father had farming in Nellur district. I want to go back to my village, disgusted with this job. But somebody in the APADC, he was an IAS officer, but he was also an electronics engineer, Ram K. Vepa, the elderly person. He is 90 plus now. He spotted me in one of the seminars and he wanted me to come and join APIDC. At the time, he coined a word called joint ventures. State government 50%, entrepreneurs 50%. State government will get the licenses. License Raj, you know, 1970s. I left uh, DLR in 77. I came to APIDC. There, the licenses from central government we used to get, state government. We spot the entrepreneur, we invest 50%, the entrepreneur has to invest 50%. He thought that it is going to work very well, public-private partnership, new joint ventures. And I was nominated on the board of the enterprise to check the health of the industry. There I found it is not a fair deal of 50-50. Entrepreneurs were spotted. They are not entrepreneurs. They were named as entrepreneurs. They are all related to some political bosses or government officials. So they were given the project. 50% they don't bring. They inflate the project cost. That is, project cost is, say, 10 crores. They make it 20 crores. And he says that I brought my 10, give me your 10. They take our 10 crores, government 10 crores. They cheat the government. The industry will not come up because they are not born entrepreneurs. They are not trained entrepreneurs. They were chosen entrepreneurs. Nothing happened. Entire, though the concept was very great, it didn't run successfully, except one out of 140, 150 industries, one or two. Everything, money was going down the tube. I said, it is not a place to work. I left that. One of the officers ridiculed me when I was pointing out this kind of cheating by the public. I mean, entrepreneurs. Industry, you can't run with all ethical means what you are talking. Running an industry is not easy. You run it in the, and then show me how it is possible. Then I took that challenge. But I didn't start at the time. There was already a running institute, Hyderabad Batteries. He is a very learned person, academician, professor, visiting professor and faculty member in ASCII. He invited me to join him. I joined him as shareholder. I invested money. 
have that is my first journey of entrepreneurship that was making batteries for defense applications innovation import substitution i liked it i i worked very well on that project was very successful but unfortunately we couldn't adjust with each other my ethical means of doing business is different from what he conceived so he didn't like my attitude he he has thrown me out literally he has thrown me out very respectfully i can submit to you people that we separated that is not the correct word i was thrown out i was in frustration i again wanted to go to my village for farming but again providence it it, it i accidentally visited my cousin in the usa he was a sci- he is a scientist he no more now he was a scientist he was making a presentation in who geneva conference on impact of immunization i t- tagged along with him it came to me as a god given gift of course at that time i i didn't thought that i was i was going to do that but i appealed that one to many industries here in pharma dr ranjit digaru i approached him he said biotechnology is not ready we are not ready for it it will take 20 years he was also under that impression i asked some company in uh, uh, ahmedabad intas they said that no biotech is not there my conception was here ccmb life sciences wonderful laboratory we have nia in delhi niv in pune central university is known for life sciences that is my half knowledge or ignorance made me to believe that we are ready for biotech industry that helped me sometimes ignorance helps it is not by motivation i moved from place to place by frustration i moved thank you that's sir a good point that's a good point to take for the people and they get frustrated they leave it they should not leave they should keep on trying thank you sir i think you have highlighted a very very important point about the dissatisfaction with status quo i think i am also able to connect it to the point you made earlier with respect to entrepreneur versus industrialist where you know the things like disruptive innovation innovation happens more with somebody who's not happy with the status quo who's dissatisfied yeah. with what's happening around thank you sir i thank also you. took take away the point sir about uh, the one is about the point you made about providence and i link it to your statement that nature conspires there were certain things which are happening in your mind and i think it yeah. all came together the third point which i take away is this why not why not we can do why not even though very very reputed and esteemed people are saying that you can't you have questioned them and you said why not i think these are three points i'd like to take away sir from this question thank you sir thank you thank you so the second question is i move a bit forward now and this is about you know the acquisition by sanofi how does how did it impact the mission and the kind of uh, you know aims and social purposes that you had with respect to shanta biotech and how did you manage it sir as time changes the requirements the situations the dynamics will change in 92 when i started i didn't had any support from any bank not even a rupee from indian bank again providence somebody from oman came and invested into the company of course i was hesitant to take his equity into the company because i had a bitter experience with hyderabad batteries but again after persuasion i agreed to have him as shareholder he is not a small person he is a foreign affairs minister of oman he came here in his personal capacity having heard that there is an effort to make a vaccine in this part of the world southern hemisphere on our own all these vaccines are produced by northern hemisphere of the globe so he came down to invest so naturally 50% of the equity went to omani i my strong belief is i never wanted to go to public issue because in those days you know harshad mehta time that's why i said as time changes several parameters change that was the days for public issues harshad mehta made fortunes by public issues it is I, my strong belief at the time was gullible public a rickshaw pullar also will go and invest in public issue this project he doesn't know the project he doesn't know the parameters of the project he, does, he doesn't understand anything the blind call he puts his share into the company think that it will multiply suppose it is successful good everybody will share it but if failure normal very poor people will get affected so i didn't want to take that chance 
because myself, I am not having any technology, proven technology with me. I have only, depending on my belief that my scientists can deliver the goods. It is a gamble. I didn't want to go for public issue. But investor who invested has to come out one day or other. So he said that, look, I helped you initial stages. Now you are on your own foot. You are running it properly, though it's not much profitable, but at least your mission is fulfilled. You have developed vaccines. Two, three vaccines have come out. Wonderful. I am very happy. You don't need me now. At this juncture, you need a strategic partner. I will give away my 50% equity. I will give away to whoever you suggest. Or else you buy from me. I said, I don't have money to buy. The right reason is to go for a strategic partner. Strategic partner is one who understands the science much better than me. And also who has access to different technologies around the globe and who has access to markets also. And I need some extra money also. So naturally, there is a need for extra money, extra market, extra technology. This farm partner, Momani partner, he is like me. He is a politician. So he agreed to sell away his 50% stock to a strategic partner called Sanofi. 50% he has got it. Okay. At the time, Manmohan Singh time, foreign direct investment was limited to 50%. The moment 50% Sanofi acquired it, my other investors, they acquired it at higher price than the normal, its actual price. By any P ratios, you know all that. It, its share cannot be more than 440 rupees. I know that because it is a socially obligated company. We never wanted to have more profit. We contained the prices. What was sold at 840 rupees, we have given it 25 rupees. Where is my profit margin? Where is my profit? My fat, everything is very controlled, very limited. Its value cannot be more than 400 rupees per share. But some of you get into the uh, to buy out other partners at three, 2,345 rupees, they bought it. When they bought it at that price, all investors have sold away and gone. And for that, at that moment, FDA also increased from 75% to 100%. So the entire stock has gone, except me as a founder, I remained. My, my, my word will not go in the board. Luckily, at that time, Sanofi, it was much needed support from Sanofi. They brought new technologies into the company. They have exported our vaccines to many countries. They added a lot of value to the company by infrastructure. Everything was good for 10 years of our agreement. They didn't change the name of the company. They didn't change the philosophy of the company. They didn't change the priority of the company. After 10 years, they are, after all, multinational companies, no owner. Only professionals will come and run it. New batch of people have come. This admiration for me, for my effort, for making indigenous development of this vaccine company, gone with the batch, new batch have come. They don't respect my word anymore. Now they want to sell at higher prices. The philosophy got defeated. I cannot do anything except sell away my stock and come out. But they want my face, my image of the uh, in the country. They are not accepting my resignation. They are still keeping me as chairman of the country. I'm not happy to continue. This is the fact. Thank you, sir, for being uh, so transparent. And uh, as you said, uh, the critical statement I take away is time changes. Time, changes. time, yeah, time is not in our control. And no. uh, thank you, sir. You also, uh, uh, you know, delved upon the benefits that the strategic partner bought and also developed during ten years, uh, so that the, the you know the the benefit of uh, what you were doing reached uh, many many more people. Correct. And then time changed. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our stakeholders yeah. got good money, sir. People who invested 10 rupees got 25 lakhs. 10 rupees, 25 lakhs. That is the ratio. Every of our employees, I have given shares. I believed in communism. I shared all my employees have given shares. When they sold, every employee has become a lakh here. The lowest of the lowest employee got 20 lakhs, 15 lakhs. Our general manager, vice president got crores. We distributed almost 85 crores to the shareholders in the company, all our employees. So everybody got benefit. Country got vaccines at low cost. Kind scientific community got the confidence that we also can do products of world standard because they are all WHO approved. So confidence level has gone up in the country, in the scientific community. Stakeholders, everybody got benefit. Country has saved a lot of formation without having to import any vaccine. We have made ourselves. We exported also, we had a lot of foreign exchange. 
and no input from government zero input lot of benefit excellent sir you have also now added on the uh, social benefit which has passed on due to the acquisition right. to the employees to the internal stakeholders and of course through the to the markets also because of the nature of the products at least for the initial 10 years thank you sir so the next question is about uh, healthcare leadership is there are there any differences between the way this needs to be looked at when you compare it with the other sectors based on your experience this industry should not be looked as profit making industry sir hospitals pharmaceutical people they have social obligation a doctor will become a doctor not by spending his father's parents money alone society pays a lot of taxes if a parent spends 1 lakh to make his son or daughter a doctor society pays 10 lakhs to make him a doctor they have a social obligation to pay back to the society give we must to take and we could have without giving what is it they are going to do they have to be compassionate other than other industries suppose you are selling a whiskey you sell it at any cost doesn't matter but i cannot sell my product at higher price taking more profit in recent times remedy civil was sold at 1 lakh rupees is it fair and appropriate is not correct but they will we will come out I, now they, i will not call they i am also part of the healthcare industry we will come out with an explanation we have spent lot of money on r and d come on let us take the accounts how much we spent on that not much it is not in commensurate with what we are charging so healthcare industry should have compassion they should have social obligation if they want to make more profits let them go to some other sector but not healthcare sector on healthcare sector it is not appropriate to keep profits as the motive only motive which is more a service oriented if you are not for that both of that sector come to other sectors excellent sir i think you have defined it with values that you know the difference between what is there in healthcare and uh, many of the other sectors is essentially one based on one the need for compassion and the second is uh, social application thank you sir it is very very clear thank you so the third question is uh, uh, in our country in healthcare we also have traditional knowledge systems ayush um going forward are we in a position to support uh, ayush segments in india for holistic treatment rather than looking at it in synthetic mode sir there is no there no much support for them unfortunately but at the same time they also should modernize their methodologies see now technology got evolved we should make use of the technology convergence of technology is very essential they should not do in their household with some kavam and other things to grind a medicine without proper weightage they should subject it to lot of tests before it is being administered there are many methodologies to accept a product they should adapt to the new tech- techniques of accepting a medicine earlier it is the vamshanagatham they used to do by family tradition they believed in what they were doing their elders but that is not the case now we have to proof of concept is very essential and we have to make it certain that it is administered in different forms different people and you have to examine the results of it then only you should standardize it now there is no standardization methods unless you standardize it by scientific methods and means they are not going to get encouragement but also government is looking at it as alternative medicine my point is our english medicine is alternative medicine our own medicine is that we have pushed it to alternative medicine which is pathetic we should have spent more time and effort and money on developing our own ayurveda <clears throat> we are looking at it as only an alternative <clears throat> what is alternative is english medicine that is my strong concept i mean uh, conviction thank you sir i think in saying so you have also opened up a huge opportunity in healthcare for those who like you at your early age will look at the why not aspect of this and hopefully some people will move forward on this thank you very much sir i think very relevant the socialization with respect to the technology aspects with respect to the methodology aspect which needs to come in for the traditional knowledge systems in healthcare uh i now hand it over to professor sudhakar rao for the next cluster thank you thank you sir i think it is becoming very very interesting your brand of uh, 
bold and honest statements that you usually make is uh, is coming across very very clearly even in this conversation thank you very much for that sir the next cluster i would like to focus is on the healthcare issues and challenges we'll move a little faster but i'll ask just one or two questions in this cluster uh, because most of it is already addressed sir as you know india imports much of the bulk drugs and intermediaries from various other countries probably more from china how can india become uh, self sufficient what is your uh, advice sir uh, over last three decades we were very negligent our governments were very negligent our pharmaceutical industry also was taking it very casual they didn't go for their own active pharmaceutical ingredient api for of their own development they thought it is easily available to import overnight and formulate it and put it in the market easiest methodology is what is called screw driven technology or cable connected technology nobody wants to work hard that is the problem with our industry and also government never allowed any company to start in the r&d sector if they insisted that we don't allow this imports from china you develop your own ipi api things would have been different china in 1990 sir i will tell you their their product production was 3% of the pharma industry today they are at 73% did they not consciously apply their mind on investment into r&d to develop api do you think that they have better minds than us not at all i will give you an interesting example who qualifies every product vaccines especially until last year china could not succeed in getting who approval for any of their product india only got it india has more usfda approval facilities than in usa what does it mean we have excellent facilities we have excellent people but we do not have the need to have our own api systems we were dependent on china and china developed it we are happily using it as an intermediary and making our lives very easy the problem with the pharma industry and also it not recognizing the impact of it by government government is for what they should anticipate the problems in future we have some problem with china on political issues suppose they stop it entire our pharma industry will go down to fumes is not a dangerous thing where is our strategy strategy is not only on war front sir even an industry should have a strategy even an economic front should have a strategy where are our experts as in this government is resident to any experts my first fundamental question governments are not applying their minds for strategic application of their minds for various sectors it is not just saving the line of control but we have to save the lives of the people we have to save the economic situation of the people we have to save our industry no concrete efforts were there from government side to make it self sufficient on api at least now they should open their eyes they should give incentives to get started on api development every industry should have their own api we start by restricting the imports that also they are not doing they should do that kind of initiatives then only will become self sufficient as of now we are still on a razor edge any day if they stop import we are in trouble let us wake up right sir thank you very much i think you have identified the root cause and you propose that we should encourage investments into r and d encouragement the government strategic application of mind not just on the war front but also in saving the lives of the people economic front to be protected not just the line of control but the lives of the people that's a very good statement that you have made that is the responsibility of the government r and d investment into developing your own api will lead to self sufficiency that is the mantra that you have advocated thank you very much sir and now i'll move to the second question <clears throat> sir and this i want to extend one more thing yes excuse me no problem in 2018 i think there were uh, some 30 lakh uh, patents for five international patents 30 lakh patents out of which china was the major contributor for the patent application from india we have applied 
2530 and in government from government side in out of 2530 only 151 65% of 30 lakhs is whatsapp 20 lakh patents for file and indian government files 131 now you understand where we are on our and different 7% of the our uh, gross pro- gdp 7% is spent on r and d our our expenditure is 0.3% how do you expect innovations in this country one medical company called pfizer in america medical company their annual budget for r and d is 5 billion dollars our entire country for every sector steel electronics you name it anything pharmaceuticals chemicals fertilizers everything put together not more than 6 billion dollars can you expect any innovation in this country national science foundation annual budget in america is 27 billion dollars our dst is not crossing 0.3 billion dollars these are the problems our national budget annual budget for defense is 147000 crores our education budget is 65 crores 65000 crores so that is the importance where wrong priorities budget allocations are totally wrong Yes, I think uh, those figures tell a very startling picture of our focus or lack of focus on R&D and sure. therefore the resultant innovation or lack of innovation is what is evident here. In spite of having good facilities, in spite of having good brains. Good minds. Good, good minds, excellent good brains. brains. Excellent. I think that's a very, very strong point that you have made. Sir, with your permission, I'll go to the second question in this cluster. These big pharma companies give... an impression that profits are the sole motive of the healthcare entrepreneurship the pandemic also has reinforced uh, this perception how do you see the future evolving with respect to especially the social objectives and also the invasion of technology and all, and the lessons that we learned from the pandemic i am not clear about the question sir what is that term? the you question know. is that uh, with respect to social objectives or social Motiv- uh, motives how the pharma industry will evolve in future because the current perception is that they are only profit oriented even tomorrow also they will be like that sir unfortunately profit is the motive profit per se is not sin but how you use that profit is the matter that matters if they make good money and they invest it to r and d they come out with new products they make the product at lower cost with high quality then it is good if they make money here and put it real estate what good it is unfortunately that is happening i think there should be a law in this country if pharma industry is making money they should put that money back into rd into the pharma world not allowed for disinvesting in that and putting elsewhere unless you do maybe it is against human interest i mean fetch what we call freedom of investment but what to do pharma companies are becoming richer and richer and people are getting affected a common man cannot afford this kind of expenditure for health we have no insurance system here today in averagely indian indian people are spending out of their pocket 47% of their cost is from their pocket very difficult for people uh, people who are living below poverty line so future also is going to be very precarious unless there are some stringent laws to contain the cost of the medicine the cost of treatment cost of health care else government should come up with their own hospitals high quality hospitals there should be it should not be a government dawakhana it should be a wonderful high high, high class high level institutions should be there in every district headquarters why only in city every district headquarter should have a, a center of expertise and people should be given motives i mean incentives to work there district quarter should be made powerful they should, all the people should not run to any city right sir i think you have very very nicely made this point of how i mean that that's consistent with your bold expression always how the future is going to be future is not going to be any different unless and until there is a radical shift in our approach in terms of the prioritization in terms of legislation or in terms of the laws that will insist that if you make money in one sector in healthcare sector plug it back for its development plug it back with the social motives rather than investing in unrelated businesses say for example real estate as you have given an example 
I think the encouragement all around for youngsters, scientific community, and for entrepreneurs also should come largely from the government when the systemic strengthening happens and encouragement for working in not just urban areas, but even in other remote areas where you prioritize, give significant incentives to them and encourage them to establish. Then I think we can make profitable social enterprises in healthcare sector. You have very nicely defined that uh, in a succinct manner. Thank you, sir. Uh, there are other questions, but I will move on in the interest of the time. There are several demotivating factors that we see, corruption in government medical departments, uh, and then the need for establishing central healthcare agency for better control, so on and so forth. I'll just skip those things, maybe that will be covered in your subsequent questions when Professor Prasad is going to ask. But one important point here is that beginning with your talk, you have it highlighted the responsibilities of uh, the social responsibilities for a healthcare entrepreneur or a vaccine manufacturer, whatever may be the case. But it should be ably supported by the government and the systems and the environment. And you need strategic partnerships with a variety of people, not just in this country, but from outside, to have access to large markets, monies, technology, and protocols. I think that is the summary uh, with which this cluster and that identified the issues and challenges of uh, healthcare. Thank you, sir. I will hand it over uh, back to Professor Prasad for the next cluster on approaches briefly, and then I'll come back for maybe a one, one and a half questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rao. Sir, the, now the question uh, uh, which we will zero in on, uh, we have more questions, but uh, there's a very important question about you know leaders and leading. And uh, we have heard in many of the questions about the negativity in the environment and the you know, pursuit of uh, objectives, which may not be what is required. So in, in such circumstances, what is your advice to leaders? What should leaders do? How do they deal with the negativity and motivate themselves so that they are able to continue on their mission? My opinion is, sir, any entrepreneur should be frustration proof. Definitely government has its own pace of work in government. Pandavas are there, Kauravas are there. Pandavas are only five, Kauravas are 100. So our luck is to meet Pandavas. There are many Kauravas, but we should search for them. That is your ingenuity. You should not be going for a wrong person. Suppose a wrong person is there in the right place. You cannot in any way avoid him, but have perseverance, tenacity to face him. Don't adjust yourself for the cause of him. You have to stand on your own. One day or other, he has to come down to you after all. So, if you are stubborn on your attitude, what if it may be delayed. For example, I give my own example. Pollution Control Board, I have to get a certificate unless I get a certificate that this premises is uh, you're not producing any pollution. It is safe. That certificate, unless, unless they give, I cannot start my production. I was waiting for that certificate for almost three months. My people were going and sitting in their office. They were not giving. I'm talking in the year 1993-94. Not now. Now situations may be changed. For three months, I waited. My people were going and coming back. They were asking for something. I, I refused. I was very stubborn on that. Ultimately, I went myself. The gentleman asked me the same. I said, I will not give. Go and apply again. Our committee will meet after six months. So I had to wait for six months. Just tell me, six months, I have lost my time. Six months, I have to pay salaries to people. Luckily, I didn't owe any money to any bank because banks have not given me any money. But I have sustained for six months. I waited for six months. That man was shifted out and then another person came. He has given the certificate. If you stand on your principle one day or other, you'll get it done. Maybe time delay. It will, it will definitely, it will have its negative impact on the company. But what to do? Suppose you start giving it. Next time also you have to give it. It continues. You are encouraging the sin. Don't do that. Be a stumbling block to it. Adhere to it. One day or other you will get it. No doubt you will have a bad impact on that. Somewhere you will make it better. That's what my belief 
and we did extremely well. Excellent, sir. I think there are uh, uh, what I would call rock solid uh, takeaways there. Uh, stand for your principles. Don't budge on that. Be frustration proof. Have uh, perseverance and tenacity because you're going to face the music while dealing with uh, some of these gentlemen. And I think very, very important is search for right-minded people, search for the Pandavas, wherever you go, whether it is in government or elsewhere. And I think through that also, you've added a lot of value. I will tell one more example, sir. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm intruding into your time. Sure. With great effort, India has come out with its own vaccine at 25 rupees. Prime Minister at the time was very happy and he was making truce with Pakistan, our enemy country. He said, Lahore diplomacy, Lahore bus. They asked, bus is okay, sir, but we need a vaccine. Your country has produced a hepatitis B vaccine. Can we have that vaccine? Until then, there was no trade between the two countries. Prime Minister office called me saying that you got an award also for that. Best technology award. That vaccine, can you give 1 million doses? We will buy from you and give it to Pakistan. I have given free of cost to the Prime Minister office. They have exported. Then, I have been given technology award for developing that vaccine. Of course, our scientists. Our government has to, that one, they have to include this into immunization schedule. Meaning, government should buy from me. This vaccine should go to every every nook and corner of the country to go to newborn children. We have uh, pr primary health centers in every village. The vaccine has to reach all those places. As a small company with low margins, I cannot dispense this vaccine to every corner of the country. Country is very vast geographically. Government has to buy it as any other vaccine. And they have to distribute it through primary health centers. To do that, they have to include this into the schedule. They have not included this. At the time, coalition government, this vaccine, pathetic story this is. This vaccine, though we got it in 97, and I got award for it. This vaccine was not used by government for 11 years. Today, times change. Prime Minister are urging every company, please develop a vaccine, please develop a vaccine. We'll buy from you. We give 1,500 crores, 3,000 crores. My vaccine was not used by government for 11 years. Manmohan Singh found a diplomatic solution. He started taking, including the immunization schedule after 11 years of our coming into the market. Our enemy country used it, but not our own country used it. It's not a tragedy. People call me an excellent. Why not? With this kind of experience, should I not become an excellent? Yes. Sir, you reminded me of the previous, uh, you know, the question that we had about how do you remain motivated? And I think you've given another example of how you stood steady against all this. So there is a question in the chat box about uh, how do we, what are the major constraints which are there, which, uh, uh, you know, for entrepreneurship pertaining to the Indian diaspora? Uh, there are a lot of IPR in the Indian diaspora. What are the constraints to harness uh, this kind of IPR uh, for the benefit of the country, for the society, maybe India, maybe outside? But particularly with relevance to India, what are the major constraints, sir? IPRs. Yes. First Indian of all, we are, we are working for some other companies. We are not working for our own companies or for any innovation. Because our company has no agenda to innovate. We are working for multinational companies and multinational companies are using our brains and they are getting their IP on, the, on their name. Brain is ours. IP is theirs. This is the paradox. Number one. Number two, if suppose a small company like Shanta develops a product, a process, and to maintain that IP internationally, you know how much it costs? Where is money for me? When I want, when I am a socially obligated company with least margins, can I support the IPR fees globally? I cannot. There should be change in the structure of the government fee for maintaining the IPRs. Government should maintain it. It is, after all, the property of the company living in India and it is indirectly giving taxes to government and government should come forward to support IPR uh, issues. On certain things, government is just silent. Thank you, sir. So you suggest that uh, you know the, the issues involved is first is that as an individual, it is very difficult to uh, support maintain the, cost, maintain the ah. IP. And uh, that you know the, the regulation is such that the IP is owned by the company. And even if you do have your own IP, it is very difficult to maintain and therefore Indeed. the solution lies with how the government government regulates this and 
takes care of the ownership of IP. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I now hand it back to Professor Sudhakar Rao. I think we are running short of time. Yes, sir. Uh, with your permission, I'll just ask two questions and then we'll wrap it up after that. Uh, what are your three most important suggestions for budding entrepreneurs in healthcare? <laughs> <laughs> sir, I am not uh, what you call a person to give any sermons to people. I myself go through a lot of difficult times. So they have to remember one thing. They are obligated to society. They have to pay back. Otherwise, I, I believe in karma siddhantam. If you do, don't clear your debts, you are again born. You have to go through mundane things. Better get rid of it. To attain moksha, you should pay back to society. That is my fundamental principle, which some people may accept or may not be accepting. So we go to society, sir, that they should be, that, that idea should be imbibed in their mind. You have come up to this point with the help of society. It is not just your parents alone supported you. Today we have, we, we are flying to some place, airports are built, roads are there, our scooter is going, our car is going on that. We are daily drinking water. Somebody is producing grain, we are eating. So all these things, Definitely we owe something to society back. They should keep it in mind. Whatever they do, you should be good for himself, number one. You should be good for the society, number two. And you should not harm anybody. If they keep it in mind, and also not necessary that everything will be um, uh, what you call bed of roses. Kite rises against wind, not with the wind. There's a fundamental point they should remember. Hurdles are there. They are only there not to stop you to refine your strengths, to make you better, to sharpen your skills. A hurdle is coming in the form of hurdle. There is an opportunity also behind it. Better take it up. Don't avoid hurdle. I think people should accept hurdles and they should recoup their strength to overcome it. Then only their skill set will come out. If everything going well, there's no need of exerting yourself. And all your skills are remaining in your body. They are never exhibited. There is no chance for them to improve. So invite hurdles, solve them. And there is no word called impossible. It's only your thinking that is impossible. Keep on trying, you will get it one day or other. My strong belief is, it is not that you are defeated when you, are, when you fall, you think that you are defeated. But not raising again is real defeat. You have to get up again. And success is not opposite of failure. And failure is not opposite of success. Failure is part of success. A first step to success. A failure is a first step to get it to success. They should not be, uh, I mean, unarmed by that. They, I will not be able to work on this. They should not have that kind of feeling. Today, many people are getting frustration very easily. They should be made frustration proof. They should be made to listen to our epic stories, Ramayana, Mahabharata. How many difficult times Pandavas have gone through? How much difficult time Rama has gone through? He is son of a Chakravarti, Rama. Pandavas on their side, Lord Krishna was there. Still they have gone through all hurdles. Did they give up? And unfortunately, today education system is only teaching mass physics chemistry, not about our culture, our tradition, our gold epic stories. They are all there to motivate people, not me to motivate them. They should read themselves our epic stories. Itihasas, Puranas are there to make you feel better and strengthen yourself. You have inner strength. You have to wake it up. Great. I think these are very good pieces of advice for budding entrepreneurs, whether it is healthcare or anything, but specifically to healthcare that realize that you are obligated to the society. Society has given you a lot. We owe a lot and pay back to the society. That is the first one. Second is, hurdles are bound to be there. Invite the hurdles, stand against them, like a kite rises against the wind. And therefore, we should be ready to face it and resolve those hurdles and challenges. Success is not against failure and failure is not against success. One leads to the other and it's a continuous process. We should be frustration proof in the sense that we should not be hit by what is called poverty mindset. Just in case you have a failure in one, it does not mean that you won't be able to bounce back or do anything. So defeat is not real unless you refuse to get up when you fall. 
So that is something which is etched in our minds and very, very important point that you made is how to learn from the epics, our itihasas and puranas and build the strength of character, build the strength of resolve and apply that in our day-to-day -day life and entrepreneurship that one is planning to embark on. Fantastic, sir. Thank you very much. The next question I would like to go to is uh, how can the student community help in healthcare social responsibility? There are some students also on the, on the uh, show today and they are also listening to us. Is there any advice to you? What role they can play uh, in terms of upholding the healthcare social responsibility? Healthcare, in healthcare. Yes. Sir, today we have many corporate hospitals and they are quite big ones, like a city itself by itself. People coming from villages, they do not know where to go, whom to approach. I think our students, if they find some leisure time, they should receive at least five or six patients or five patient attendees. They should guide them. They should be able to understand to which department he has to go. Suppose somebody comes with a stomach ache, you go to a gastroenterology department or somebody comes with a problem with the ear, you should go to ENT department. This kind of guidance is a service, it is a seva. Be compassionate with them, try to make them, I mean, feel homely. If normally what is happening, I, I have been observing many times, they come and stand there. The receptionist will attend to only phone calls, not to the people who are coming there. They are always on phone. Somebody should guide them which department they should go. Doctor writes some x-ray. They don't know where to go, how to go. I think such kind of small services may not be very intellectual service, but at least a compassionate ground is there. And if you handhold them, what they can do next step, that will help them a lot. And also doctors write prescription. They should be able to buy those medicines, take them to a pharmacy. Every corporate hospital has a pharmacy. Help them there, what they should buy, and how to use, he will write TBD. They don't understand what it is. You should be able to help them. Twice a tablet, this tablet should be taken in the morning, after food or before food. This kind of help in healthcare is most essential, not necessarily an engineering student or a, what you call a high aid profile, but normal students, high school students, or BA, BSc, BCom, anybody. They, if they can spare at least weekly for one or two hours for this kind of work, they will have some sort of satisfaction. If you get happiness only when you serve something, sir, not when you get something. When you give something, you get happiness. Let them start doing that small way. Later, they can go to a higher level of service or help. That is a habit for me. That is a simple habit for me. Yes. To help. I think that's a very pertinent suggestion given to the student community to start volunteering to guide those patients who come from other parts into some of the bigger hospitals especially in terms of guiding to the right department or the right doctor, reading the prescriptions and helping with the pharmacy. I think these are the basic things with which the students can begin to lend their helping hand for the social aspect of the healthcare sector. I think that's a very, very uh, pertinent uh, uh, suggestion given by Dr. Varaprasad Reddy. Thank you very much, sir. I think uh, we are now hitting 9 p.m. and it is half an hour beyond the time that we have sought from you. We will now close it, sir. Uh, there are several other questions, obviously, but we will skip those questions. Uh, one such question is somebody wanted to ask you, and I'll ask as a last question. Sir, I want to start up in naturopathy. Is it sustainable business in the current scenario? Everything is sustainable, sir. Naturopathy is one of the best, in my opinion. I will tell you the reason is they don't use any medicine. Body has, human body has self-correcting mechanism and we normally ignore it. We try to intervene with the God's design of human body by applying some medicine. The medicine, what we are using, regular medicine, allopathic medicine, they are treating only the symptom, not the root cause. The root cause is different. Suppose you have a headache. If you swallow a paracetamol tablet, the brain will not get the signal from the point of problem to the brain. So pain is not felt, but the problem remained. We are not addressing that problem. Naturopathy addresses that. 
that will allow the body to recoup itself to correct itself i think one of the best methodologies naturopathy uh, if anybody wants to there are many now already um, jindal is there and uh, pema is there in vizag santvana is there in hyderabad so i think they should pursue this it is a good one but they should have a lot of patience because patient when he is suffering when he is not getting medicine psychologically he will be down he should be treated and he should be given assurance unless the person who is starting it unless he has conviction on that with a lot of experience on that he cannot satisfy the patient so it is a long run process it is worthwhile trying and more naturopaths should come he should get trained elsewhere and then he should have conviction so that tomorrow he can treat the patient with confidence naturopathy is very good right so that's a that's a thumbs up for naturopathy whoever has asked that question so but a lot of patience is required which focuses basically on the self correcting mechanism of the body and that should not be restricted it should be allowed and flourished so that we can treat the patient with the right aspect and then a lot of patience is required for the entrepreneur who is pursuing this thank you very much sir for this uh, fantastic session lots of answers lots of questions but i think there's a great deal of clarity when we have listened to you and did, i would like to, did you take like, more time for answering your questions no 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 fantastic i think this is not that an easy press not prasad sir was telling that already we crossed half an hour <laughs> no no it's okay it's okay we 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 will close this session but i'll summarize and i'll i would like to thank you for this amazing session the lessons for all of us the entrepreneurs the students practitioners and the budding leaders for everyone the questions are very important from the journey of shanta biotech shanta biotech in the early 90s has done something which actually creates a path for success for most of us to emulate and especially in this country if you want to have innovation especially in biotech innovation the four important lessons that uh, the journey gives us one is identify a therapeutic area where cost efficiencies can be achieved locally and combine it with strong leadership by leveraging in home grown scientists or the talent or low labor costs achieve process innovation low margin business strategy to exploit the opportunity here the low margin business opportunity is to reduce the price of the offer uh, the medicine that you are offering and identify the large base that is available probably something akin to the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid proposed by uh, ck prahlad the management guru so i think that is the first lesson that we have learned from the journey of shanta biotech second is seek investments and partnerships from non traditional and international sources that will stand in aid and support of you in your journey at every stage uh, you need support from various people so seek investments and partnerships strategic uh, from not just from traditional but also from non traditional and international sources third focus on innovation and reinvestment plowing back the returns on to r and d i think shanta biotech has spent somewhere around 12 to 25% of its income into r and d that's pretty phenomenal and uh, they have led uh, the healthcare entrepreneurship in this country starting from early 90s and and up till till recently as the story has been unfolded by dr varprasad reddy shanta biotech actually became the first who approved pre qualified indian firm for hepatitis b vaccine and which opened the door for several large international contracts the fourth one the lesson is integrated business models are viable in countries like india shanta biotech did not invest in any product for which did not have internal capacity to execute on a significant part of the project whereas the developed world other countries probably are becoming increasingly popular to develop a virtual business model where clinical trials and even early stage work is outsourced to contract research organizations so virtual models may not make any sense for an innovative biotech in a developing country like ours these are fantastic lessons from the journey of shanta biotech and from the entrepreneurial zeal displayed by dr varaprasad reddy it is so evident that entrepreneurs should be uh, frustration proof they should display a sense of perseverance and also the tenacity to make this country a better place to live 
I think we should always be socially obligated, display a lot of patience, do networking and connectivity because we owe it back. That's a very, very solid belief and conviction that because of the society and the country, you have reached a particular stage. Therefore, we need to give it back to the society. I think one trigger, there are many other triggers, but one trigger is when WHO talked ill about certain countries on their competence to develop certain medicines. If that spurs a strong resolve in an entrepreneur to develop an indigenous technology, I think that moment has made this country so proud. I think we all should reinvest uh, our energies and time and, and also recalibrate ourselves to doing something great, which is going to be useful to this country. And that is the sign of patriotism more than any other empty signals that people tend to give. Thank you very much, sir. One last point I want to make and close it. The life lessons from Dr. Varaprasad Reddy is that you don't have to be always a domain expert to start something or to become an entrepreneur. That is pretty, pretty clear. And if you have the power of the idea, if the normal cause is something which you're pursuing, the nature will conspire and everything will fall in place and help you achieve that dream. On this fantastic note of learning and happiness and delight, on behalf of everyone here at ICFI, I would like to thank Dr. Varaprasad Reddy for this extremely motivating and enlightening session marked with boldness, honesty, and sir always takes names. He doesn't mince words. That is the character and uh, the unique feature of uh, Dr. Varaprasad Reddy. I really enjoyed and I'm sure all the members around the screen, including some of the senior members from across the country have also enjoyed. I can see their comments on the chat box. They're all appreciative of this. We will send these comments and uh, some of the unfinished questions by email to you, sir. And whenever you are free, you can respond to that. We thoroughly have enjoyed. Uh, Professor Prasad also has enjoyed. And uh, we, would like to, we would like to express our gratitude on behalf of everyone on the screen today for this invaluable time that you have spent with us. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I am also delighted to speak to you. It's one of the good interviews I had because earlier, I call it their interview, it's not a question and answer. Many people try to ask me questions, but they are very, very shabby. They say that, uh, uh, why did you not give that bribe? How much they wanted to, uh, how much they asked you? Uh, how much you were prepared to give? This kind of interviews I had gone through, but this is very unique, uh, very thought provoking, and many people, if they get benefit, students especially, I am very happy on that. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. It is extremely useful. It's extremely useful. I can tell you, this has been one of the eye-opening and also having strategic relevance to each and every response that you have made on those important points. It's not easy to give responses, while it's also not easy to come up with good questions. So I think every one of you, including sir, has made this 36th webinar a wonderful session. We have learned a lot. We look forward to leaders like you, sir. And... Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, we'll meet again next Friday on December 31st with yet another leader. Uh, we will have to have these leadership conversations every Friday. We will do it on 31st and then we will wish you Happy New Year. But for now, we will wish you a happy and Merry Christmas. Have a nice weekend and we'll see you again on 31st of December. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all and good night. Thanks.